Yes, I am back at the Rock Island Auction Company. I learned a couple of lessons the last time I was here, so I've picked up some new equipment and I've actually had time to read the operator's manual for some of the equipment that I already had, which I unfortunately did not have time before I came out here last time. However, I'm going to quickly address a question that often comes up in the comments because, well, Ian from Forgotten Weapons tends to come here and we tend to release our videos from here at about the same time. Have I done a collab with him? No, I never met the man. And although I'm sure I will eventually, he's already been out here, he's done his thing, he's filmed, and if you want to learn about these pop guns, go over to his channel, nobody does it better. Personally, I'm off looking for something a little bit bigger. Oh, this is a little bit bigger. It's impressive. And although, believe it or not, I do have a pilot's license, it's not for one of these, not for anything even like one of these. And tempting though it is, I'm probably not going to be able to do this one justice, so let's find something else. This, however, is a little bit more my scene. Regulars to my channel will know this is one of my favorite vehicles. Now, I'm going to leave the story of the M2 and M3 half-track cars for another day, probably when I'm actually looking at a plain old M2 or M3 half-track car. In the meantime, I'm going to pick up the story in October of 1940. So the Americans are paying some attention as to the goings on in Europe. And they, like everybody else, are seeing the German newsreels showing the Panzer forces and the Luftwaffe sweeping across Poland and France, laying waste to all before them. And of course, especially France, once uh, the word of what was going on for the Panzer divisions hit America, this gave a little bit of impetus to well, can we come up with equipment that will stop the Panzers, and that sets us off to the anti-tank uh, side of the story, and also, can we come up with equipment that will prevent the German Air Force from playing such a decisive role? It is perhaps interesting to speculate how the US Army would have entered the war had the Germans actually been emphasizing in their propaganda newsreels the horse-drawn army that actually made the majority of their forces. Maybe the Americans wouldn't have just thrown everything in. Well, maybe they did. Who knows? Wouldn't have made a difference, perhaps. So anyway, we are now going to have a look at this M16 multiple gun motor carriage, which is uh, well, going up for sale in the auction block in a couple of weeks. So anyway, October of 1940. A program has started. Contract is given to Bendix Aviation to come up with a twin caliber 50 mount. And they did. There's trials and a couple of lessons were learned. The first lesson was that the mount needed to be something a little bit more stable than a one-ton 4x4 truck. The second lesson was that Bendix Aviation didn't make a very good caliber 50 mount. So back to the manufacturer it went for more investigation and trials and fixes and whatever else you do when your system doesn't work as advertised. This took a while. In fact it took so long that uh, in the meantime W.L. Maxson comes up with his own design for a twin caliber 50 mount and submits it for the Army's consideration. This would be known as the M33, and it was a self-contained unit. It had anything from the operator to the batteries, all in one, shall we say, module, and it just blew the competition right out of the water. It was tested on an M2 half-track in April of 42, and by September of 42 it had been standardized as a multiple gun motor carriage M13. You put the same twin mount in the back of an M5 half-track, and now you have a MGMC M14. Of course, I should point out that the M13 by now would be moved to an M3. It was a little bit bigger. Now, whilst one M2 tends to garner respect, and two is definitely an attention-getter, this was apparently insufficient DACA for, of all organizations, the Coast Artillery. They would like a quad 50 mount, if Ordnance would be so kind as to provide them with one. And Ordnance Branch, being the helpful types that they were, set about doing so. Now, initial attempts such as the T-37 MGMC were less than successful, but again, Maxon shows up with a solution. What they basically did was they took the M33 twin mount, they put two more caliber 50s on it, redesignated the M45, and hey presto, you got yourself a quad 50, huzzah! Well, there's actually a little bit more to it than that, but it's the general gist. 
The type very quickly gained approval. It was standardized in December of 42, although it was May of 43 before the production lines opened up and the MGMC M16 started rolling off the line. If you put the same quad mount in the back of the M5, the International Harvester half track, well, you end up with the M17. Now, one of the things I love about the US half track series is that they are such beautifully simple vehicles. If you imagine this is basically a 4x4 truck, except that the rear wheel has been elongated into a track shape, you really won't be far off. You can also see the family resemblance with the M3 Scout car that I'd filmed earlier. Just imagine it a little bit longer. The body is of quarter inch steel all over with the exception of the windshield plates. They're held in place by oval head screws, self-locking nuts on the backside. Makes replacement and repair very easy. If you move forward a little bit, well, you come to the characteristic fenders made of pressed steel. Uh, the harvester version, it's one of your giveaways, is a much more angular flat shape. Come a little bit further forward again and you come up to the winch. The half tracks, of course, would come either with an anti-ditching roller or a winch. Now, according to the manual, which is, if you're curious, TM9-710, all of the M16s came with a winch. Headlights could be dismountable. The later versions were. And under the fender are your 20 by 7 wheels. They're mounted on leaf springs with dual action shock absorbers. Of course, the front axle is driven. Tires come to 55 PSI and are, of course, on those lethal split rims. Otherwise, at the front, very simple bumper, couple of tow hooks, your louvers for the radiator cooling, and then you get to the hood. So the hood itself, uh, again, it's the accordion type. We've seen it before. Two spring-loaded latches. And we can see the white 160 AX, 386 cubic inches, inline six cylinder, water cooled, 147 horsepower. Components are, again, easy to figure out because this is a simple mechanical engine. Big generator, starter motor, you got an electric fuel pump in this one and not a mechanical one. Your spark plugs are really obvious. The carburetor, well, it's on the first side, cut and set in, uh, image. Radiator cooling system, uh, which comes down obviously to the fan. The fan is uh, driven by the belts. There really isn't much to the system. Uh, it's very, part of the reason this thing is so popular with collectors. You can keep it going. You can just make out the steering shaft. The steering is done by a cam and lever design. The cams are actually tapered a little bit, so depending on how far you crank the wheel, you get more and more turn. It's, uh, it's basically a, a ratio depending on the necessity of your turn. Again, not much to be said about this other than it's wonderfully simple. Moving further back, we have the droppable windshield armor. It's on three supports. Uh, of course, do take out the glass before you try to drop the armor, otherwise you will not be very happy. There are also removable windshield wipers. Continue our tour back. Wing mirror and jerry can are obvious, as is the Pioneer tools. And then we start coming to the main body. You'll note that it's hinged to allow room for the caliber 50 mount to properly rotate. So the two sides and the back will hinge down. And then of course you get to the track system. So we come to the fun bit, the tracks at the back. And uh, of course this is quite simply you remove the wheel and you insert the drive sprocket. The main part of the suspension is the bogey. It's a vertical volume suspension system. Each bogey has two sub bogies, forward and aft. Each sub bogey has four road wheels. Rubber tired, of course. There is a central return roller at the top. 
and the compensating idler is at the back end which as you can see is also on a coil spring for some more suspension but it is also where you adjust the tension up at the front is the drive sprocket and yes you can see it does have teeth the teeth mesh with the metal that is inside the rubber track now the track itself of course uh, is what gives you the extra traction to make this a more capable vehicle off-road than let's say the scout car now if the track isn't sufficient it is actually possible to get chains just they're just like snow chains on the car except they're much much longer and you strap them to the track now the other thing about the track is that as it's continuous you can't break track in order to change it so what you have to do is you get a crane and you get a big chain and you lift up the bogey you basically take the weight of the vehicle compress the bogey springs without compressing the track loosen the tension on the back end and there should be enough sag in the track now that with a couple of pry bars or uh, planks of wood or whatever you have handy you can lever the track off and replace it with a new one Finding spare track for these things is a little bit tricky. Uh, there was until recently a good source in Israel because the Israelis uh, used these half tracks for quite a period of time and well they had a good supply of spare track. Well that has apparently since run dry and now folks are having to source the track from other places. If you get underneath it again this is so simple a vehicle that if you understand a truck you can understand this half track. So we take the power takeoff, comes from the transfer case, down through past, this is your handbrake disc or your parking brake, and it is quite literally just a disc brake. Power continues through a universal joint into the differential, from the differential goes, as you would expect, to the drive wheels. And so we come to the back, and you'll see that there is no door on the back of the M16. Now there is one on the back of the M16A1, for reasons I'll come back to in a moment. Another thing to look for is see if you have hard corners or round corners on the back of the compartment. If you have hard corners like this, solid 90 degree angles, you have yourself an M16, manufactured by white or diamond T. If you have a rounded corner you have yourself an M17 manufactured by International Harvester and these are almost exclusively donated to Lend-Lease and well in practice that meant the Soviet Union. Further down you have your pintle and a receptacle for the trailer braking system, electric brakes, simple tail lights and marker lights and a luxury item canvas mud flaps we're going to finish our tour of the outside of the vehicle going up the right side past the exhaust pipe up to the battery box which stays in the same location as it was in the scout car and also the doors are exactly the same as they were in the scout car complete with the flip down armor shielding look inside you have the same louver control for the radiator at the front the armor shielding all the way forward is all the way closed and then you have the four individual stages you can select from to get all the way back to the full open position one of the annoyances with this vehicle is on the floorboard where you would like very much to put your foot I say floorboard it's probably a running board the, the little thing at the step on the outside there's a shovel right where you'd want to put your foot which is a little irritating same general layout as we saw before in the M3 complete with the wonderful sort of art deco-ish dash that I very much appreciate very large steering wheel has a significant disadvantage if you're my height because it really gets in the way of your leg uh, I have tried to get to the far side from here and I just can't do it. I have to open the side door. reason it is such a large steering wheel is that there is no power steering. You are down to simply using the leverage of your arms and if you have a large steering wheel it makes it easier. 
Nothing particularly unusual about the layout of the vehicle. You start off with your RPM gauge on the left. Has a uh, little plate here that shows you what all the settings are for your knobs and levers. There is a builder's plate on the right. You can see the vacuum controllers for the windshield. So as long as the engine is operating, there is a vacuum coming in through the pipe. When you turn on the windshield wipers, the, it opens up a valve on the far side, and instead of being sucked in one place, the wiper starts wiping, I guess, from the bottom. And when the wiper gets to a certain level, it sort of hits a, uh, uh, a valve, for lack of a better term. It, it, it's, it's like the entire hinge system is part of the valve. Then all of a sudden, the vacuum is switched to the other side, a bit like a piston and back goes the wiper again and the u.s army vehicles kept this vacuum system of wipers for quite a length of time and honestly i'm not entirely sure i understand why because you would think this vacuum system would be a, just a prime opportunity for a leak wing nuts holding in the windshield as i say you've got to pull out the windshield blocks before you lower the uh, armor plate it'll be a little bit embarrassing otherwise uh, i do have a wing mirror there is uh, the rheostat here that I mentioned for towing a trailer with the electric brakes. So you set the weight of the trailer between, you know, heavy right now or all the way down to light. And when you apply the brakes to the vehicle, it'll transmit it to the, the electric brakes on the trailer. Ignition switch. This is not original. It is, however, a very common aftermarket modification, shall we say, for the private collectors. Not least because you want to make sure that nobody wanders off with your half-track, I guess. I, kind of, I really don't know how big a deal half-track theft is, but I guess. Choke, hand throttle. Uh, this here is the horn. A very simple horn, but it works. Uh, the original ignition will be here. Uh, there used to be a push button start. So the old uh, floor mounted starter pedal is gone from this vehicle that we'd seen before. And it would have been, you turn on the ignition, you push the ignition button, which would have been here. Uh, and uh, that is how you would have started it. Uh, speedometer obviously, and uh, a glove compartment again with a lock. You do have to select which of the two fuel tanks you're going to use. There are selectors down here behind the driver. Uh, the two fuel tanks, right and left, 30 gallons each. Out of three and a half gallons to the mile, that will get you a grand total of about 200 miles. It's 45 miles an hour is the maximum permissible top speed. In high range, in low range, it is 18 miles an hour. Turning radius, 30 feet. Fording depth, 32 inches. Headlight control, again with the blackout lockout, depending on how far uh, out you pull, that lets you know which set of the front and rear lights you have operating, how bright they are. And, well, that's basically it. When you look down at the pedals, your clutch, or what you think is a clutch, is actually a clutch. The brake is, well, the brake, There's uh, it's a hydraulic system, drum brakes everywhere. And of course the accelerator pedal is the little pedal on the right. Levers, you got the power take off for the winch. A four speed manual transmission. First top left, well sure, just look at the look at the, the diagram here. Handbrake, forward is off, back is on. Then you have the two levers, one for the transfer case range for low or high range, low being forward, and then one for the engage or disengage of the uh, the front axle. It is possible to have it in 6x6 high, but if you go into low, it must be in 6x6 low. Uh, I say, so, I'm sorry, this isn't a 6x6 truck, it's, a, it's basically a 4x4. Uh, so front axle must be engaged in low. Uh, other things, so the seat that I'm on, there's one right next to me here for a passenger, uh, right in the middle. And I would assume that there's one on the right that seems to be missing from this particular vehicle. Now, viewers will recall that I mentioned at Tank Fest that the M16 is the only vehicle in which I'd ever popped a wheelie. And again, if you missed it, it was because it was in first gear, low range. I didn't realize that the ratio was so low that you just let go of the clutch and it will idle up the hill. Uh, no, I 
drop the clutch, put on the accelerator, and that was it. But that gives you an impression of the level of uh, traction that you can get to get yourself out of whatever it is that you got stuck in. But if you really do get stuck, well, that's what the winch at the front is for. Controlled by the power takeoff on the right, uh, depending on where you place it, it's either in, uh, to wind or unwind the winch. The actual speed and uh, start or stop is controlled by your clutch and the accelerator. It is possible thus to not only have your power takeoff on, but also be in low range, first gear, with the axle engaged. So now you're pulling with the winch and the wheels and the tracks. Now, if you are so badly stuck that you can't get out with the vehicle in low range, first gear, wheels engaged, tracks engaged, chains on the tracks, chains on the wheels, and the winch pulling you, a, you deserve a medal, and B, you're going to be prohibited from ever driving again. Of course, what makes the M16 so unique is the M45 Quad 50 mount. Um, as far as I can tell, these are dummies, but I've no doubt that some owner of a 45 somewhere has the appropriate permits and has put four live caliber 50 on it. Sadly, I cannot demonstrate the joy which would result. The manual describes the thing as a self-contained semi-armored mount, electrically driven, that is capable of being mounted on a fixed towed or self-propelled mount. In this case, of course, obviously we are in the self-propelled here. Uh, in practice, what it actually means is that there is two 6-volt batteries wired in series to give it a 12-volt power source. To keep that charge is a single-cylinder Briggs & Stratton engine. And uh, it doesn't keep the battery fully charged per se. What, what it does is it provides enough juice that if you have the mount 5 minutes on and 5 minutes off, you can keep the whole system going for about 5 hours. Everything is basically bolted onto the back of the half track. This means that the entire mount is fully independent of the car's system. So the car can be completely powered off, master power off. The quad 50s on the back will still operate. To the front of the mounts are the seats, which are basically just padded cushions and God knows where you're supposed to put your feet for the two assistant cannoneers. Uh, you can doubtless guess that the best way this thing to operate is spun around the back so that the cannoneers have room to operate because right now as it is you can imagine that in the back if the uh, if the machine guns were to spin if the mount were to spin they would get crushed uh, this was something that was solved a little bit later on in uh, towards the end of the m45's life now, as an aside i'm sitting on one of the two 30 gallon fuel tanks the semi-armored mount has little fold-down flaps here for better vision. I mean, armor is a relative term. Remember, the whole vehicle is only quarter-inch armor, and as you can see, the, the flaps here for the gunner aren't a whole hell of a lot better. Obviously, we have four large bins. Each one carries 200 rounds of caliber 50, and that is the function of the two LEDs here, obviously, to, to keep control. The guns are mounted by use of the simple cross bolts that you would ordinarily expect to find on an M2. The whole shebang comes in at about 2,400 pounds. The electric motors will spin the turret around to full 360 in six seconds. Maximum elevation is 90 degrees. Maximum depression is 10, at least in theory. There, there are a couple of interlocks in the system uh, to make sure that you don't run into bits and bobs like the the driver's head. I'm sure he'll be very annoyed. Now I'm not going to really stand at the back because there's no room for the camera and me at the same time. So enter cut shots of the location of the two batteries which are removed, the single cylinder engine that I mentioned before together with the fuel tank just above it. The gunner's seat is it's a very simple sort of sling thing. He's got his controller, he would have the reflector sight, uh, the reflector sight would be a Mark 9, and note use of the Mark designation. That means that it was nicked from the Navy, uh, because if it was Army, it would be an M designator. The U.S. Navy actually nicked it from the British. It's actually a Bar and Stroud GJ3. Of course, the job of the two extra cannoneers is reloading the large 
round bins, which sounds like a lot, but believe me, when you uh, have your finger on the trigger, that 200 rounds goes surprisingly quick. A total of about 5,000 rounds of ammunition would be carried around the vehicle, which is plenty enough to ruin anybody's day. Uh, however, it turned out that opportunities to shoot a German aircraft were somewhat limited due to the effectiveness of the Allied Air Forces, uh, which I don't know if that annoyed the anti-aircraft gunners or not. Uh, so absent anything up to shoot at, they simply pointed the gun sideways and they shot at ground targets. It proved surprisingly effective. The Germans that were on the receiving end apparently did not appreciate this. Another group of people that did not appreciate this were the Chinese in Korea because they did a lot of the human wave attacks of the time, and you needed something that had a fairly high rate of fire to deal with them. Enter again the gun motor carriages, the anti-aircraft role where you just point the gun sideways and hose away. In fact, so much demand was there for the M16 half-track that they ended up taking regular M3 personnel carrier half-tracks and adding M45s to those as well. Now, they can be easily distinguished because those are the ones that have the door at the back that I mentioned. When they converted them from the personnel carrier, they never got rid of the door. And they also don't have the drop-down side, so be a little bit careful as you're depressing your cannons. There was one additional attempt to take the concept and just turn the dial to 11. And that was an attempt to put the Elko B6 turret under the back of the half track. So the B6 not only had four 20 millimeter cannon, it also had two caliber 50s as outriggers. This turret was originally designed for PT boats and it was just too much for the half track to handle. So sadly, that was the end of that. In total, 3,614 of these M16s were built and an additional 1,000 M17s were built basically for the Soviet Union. 600 of the M16s were actually conversions off of the earlier twin mount M13s. Now once the value of the system he demonstrated again in Korea, which I mentioned you convert the M3 armored personnel carrier uh, to the M16A1, April of 52 an order was placed for an additional 1622 conversions. Now, in addition, as I said, to the rear door and the non-dropping side panels, other differences were a six-inch riser for the mount to make sure that you didn't hit the side paneling on the, uh, the vehicle body. And also, they installed much wider armored shields to protect against return fire. So that's it. As I said, I really like this vehicle. And since I didn't end up with the M3 Scout car, maybe I should start a GoFundMe for this one. Anyway, tune back in uh, maybe mid to late May, and I'll update in the text description at the bottom just how much this thing went for. That was it. I hope you found it interesting and informative. I'll see you on the next one. Uh, to start her up, there really isn't much to it if it's cold, which really it isn't right now. You'd pull the choke out. Uh, you could set the hand throttle to a certain level. This one seems to be stuck, but trust me, you don't need it. Uh, again, this is a retrofitted thing, so we'd set the ignition. Pull down the clutch, make sure you're in neutral anyway, and uh, turn her over. Or not. Don't have the starter running any more than 10 seconds at a time, otherwise you run the risk of burning it out. Let the choke slip slowly out. Let her idle for a little bit. And, well, once you're ready to go, drop the handbrake and uh, set off. It was trialed on an M2 in April of 1941 and, well, things worked out very nicely indeed because of reasons. Right. 
take three. Underneath the white 160 AX, inline six cylinder, 147 horsepower. Or is it 147 cubic inches? Got down. 147 horsepower, inline 386. And the steering is done by a bevel. And I'm going to look this one up again because I think it's done by a bevel. No, it's a camera lever with an actual continuous track system. It runs... Oh, God damn.